Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you're ready to increase your confidence in conversations and conflict, deepen your self-awareness, expand your connectedness, and enrich your relationship with yourself and other humans you care about, and even those you wish you didn't, you're in the right place. Enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome. Sometimes we have difficulties letting go of things. Have you noticed that? Maybe not you, but somebody you know, right? (laughs) And today we're going to talk about those things and why that happens and what you can do about it, how you can maybe think about it differently. And I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. You know, you can find me at forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R Relationship Help H-E-L-P dot com. And today I want to talk about this idea of clearing clutter in ways that are really good for your soul. You know, that you really feel good about having done that. No matter what that clutter is, if it's emotional or financial or physical or memorabilia, or you have a basement full of things or your parents just passed on and you've got a house full of things that they had that you don't know what to do with. It could be clutter from a relationship past. It could be mental clutter from maybe your parental relationship. And maybe on the physical level, it's easier to talk about. I remember when I bought my house eight years ago and I was moving in and I was not only moving, I was moved because I just, it was a whole thing. I mean, I was really uh, delighted to be moving into a house I'd been renting for a long time. And I, so I was moved by that emotionally, but I was moving and uh, I still had some boxes around and things. And I was thinking, okay, everything that comes into this house, I want it to be something I know. I don't want to bring boxes full of stuff that I don't know what's in them. I haven't made the conscious choice to bring it into my life. And I had always had this sense of wanting to have what I called a quote unquote chosen life. And I promised myself that in this new house, I would live out my dream of creating a chosen life. And what it meant to me was that every single thing that I brought into the new house or into my newly built storage shed had to be held in my hand and chosen to continue living with me. Now, that was before Marie Kondo. I moved into my house eight years ago. And so I had that thought that this is a big deal. And I had never really been that way before. I'd hung on to things or carted them around and was going to get rid of them someday. And I'd been holding on some very old me stuff. And you might relate to that too. Stuff that you just are habitually used to having around. You think you should. Somebody gave it to you. You know, that kind of stuff. And I asked myself, why do I have my mother's writing desk in my storage area for all these years? It carried nothing but unhappy memories for me. In fact, I have this very clear memory of going to her when I was, I don't know, six or seven years old, and I asked her to play with me. And she said, no, I have to work. And I looked at her. I remember doing this. And of course, she told the story over and over, trying to make me look stupid. But I remember she. I looked at her and I said, I don't know why you had a child. You're always too tired or too busy. And that was a pivotal moment for me. And it was tied to that desk. And yet I was carting that desk around. It carried nothing but unhappy memories for me. And I'd carted it from house to house, even from Canada to the United States when I moved there. And it's the only piece of her furniture I still had. And she's been gone for 20 years. And we weren't close So it was a big moment. Bye-bye writing desk. 
So today we're going to talk about the idea of what we can do to release ourselves from the hold that things have over us or seem to have, or that we are attached to, the way that we hang on to things. I used to teach feng shui, and I'd help my feng shui clients declutter and release things. And I tell them, you know, take a photograph of something that you no longer want, but you you think you, you know, you don't want it in your space, but you have a happy memory of it, or you think even you should still have it. Just take a photograph of it. I'm sure didn't take a photograph of that writing desk, I'll tell you. (laughs) But even though this chosen life commitment slowed down the process of moving, it was so worth the time and energy. And I think that you will find it is too. And it will free you up. I know that it frees me up. I do it regularly now. Surprisingly, there are a lot of things that I still have that I no longer need because the newest me understands that that's not required. It is not memorable. It is not beautiful. It is not functional for me, but it might be for someone else. So today's show with Sharon McCrill, the author of Downsizing the Silver Tsunami and the CEO of the Betty Brigade, is going to talk with me about all these very valuable, very important things that will help you make good decisions about what to keep and what to release. So stay tuned. Call up a friend right away if you think they need to hear this. And uh, we'll be right back. Hello and welcome to this episode. We're always having great guests, somebody with a different take from a different perspective. And today I have a really good friend and colleague. Her name is Sharon McCrill. Hi, Sharon. And uh, we're going to talk about something that, oh, it's a little shadowy something. It's something that maybe you're not used to having outed. And we're going to out it today. And that's the idea of You just might have a tiny bit of clutter. You might have a whole lot of clutter. You might have a garage that you never open the door if the neighbors can see. There might be all kinds of things. Or on the other side, which Sharon is just an expert at, and she's written a book about called Downsizing the Silver Tsunami. We're going to talk about that. There it is. There it is. And um, what do you do when your parents pass and you're left with the stuff and you've got the emotional connection and you've got the oh big questions that I have for Sharon because I've been through this (laughs) (laughs) I know so let me tell you a little more about Sharon and then let's jump in Sharon McCrill likes to help people get things done and particularly busy people Now, that would be most of us these days. So she's the owner and the president. I love this. Don't you love this? The Betty Brigade. Doesn't that just bring up a whole bunch of people with bandanas on their head coming in to save the day? I love that. And uh, she's based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And she is an organization, a relocation company, just as you would have expected. And her team of 10 Bettys, love that, perform such projects as moving coordination, organizing, and I bet they give you a little nudge and a shove here and again, <laughs> and and then staging so that you can also get that home on the market and get going. So you can find out way more about her at the Betty Big, oh, sorry, I put the that in there. Know that. BettyBrigade.com. B-E-T-T-Y B-R-I-G-A-D-E dot com. So uh, welcome, welcome again, Sharon. Well, thank you. I am delighted to be here with you, Roberta. You are, you are just, you're one of my heroes because you help people with what's going on between their ears. And I help people with what's going on in their homes. <laughs> yeah. And their garages and their yards and their storage units. <laughs> all of those places. <laughs> okay. So give us a clue. How did you ever start doing this? Um, well, I got downsized from my corporate job and uh, it was completely unexpected. Um, I worked uh, I worked for a number of years and did project management inside corporations. Oh, and so uh, so when uh, me and 70 people got downsized, 
I took my project management skills and applied them to a residential model. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons I love that is I teach negotiation in the project management MBA program at the University of Texas. So I understand the applicability and transferability of skills at a high level. And I didn't so, know you did that. Wow. Yeah. That's, I love learning about you. <laughs> so, yes, perfect. See, she didn't just think, I've got to find something else to do. She took the skills she already had at a high level, transferred them. So that's a big step up. So no wonder you're so successful at what you do. But why organizing? Why, why this? <clears throat> why didn't you pick another area to work in? Well, I was, after I got downsized, I was watching Oprah laying on my couch, feeling sorry for myself. And she was doing one of those live your best life shows. And there was a bunch of people who had started their own businesses. And I had always, my grandparents and my parents had owned their own businesses. And I always thought, well, they work really, really hard and I don't want to work that hard. I'll go work for somebody else. Uh, but as I was watching this show, and watching all of these people that had started their own businesses, I realized that it didn't have to be traditional. It didn't have to fit any particular mold. And I'm all about breaking rules. So, um, so that actually really appealed to me. So one of the suggestions that um, one of Oprah's guests made was make a list of things that you are good at and a separate list of things that you know how to do. Like those are two separate lists. And so then when, once I looked at those things, I was able to really easily then see, okay, I could organize people. I could run their errands. I'm really good at time management um, and I'm good at communication. So those are the kinds of things that I knew I could combine and so I started a part-time business and while I was still looking for another corporate job. And so I started doing, I started doing Betty Brigade work just as a hobby. And then I got another corporate job, which I was so miserable at. I mean, it was, you know, when you don't like the job and you don't like the people that you're working with, it was one of those kind of jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I left there and, gave myself one year to make Betty Brigade work. I, I really kind of do, drew a line in the sand by saying, okay, if I can't, I didn't need to be profitable, but I needed to break even in a year. And as long as I could break even, um, then I knew I'd be doing okay. And so I hired my first employee at the 11 month mark and she stayed with me for five years. And, um, and this, or, well, in, Mar in March of 2019, we are celebrating 16 years in business. So really, really excited about that. Well, now I have this picture of you and the 69 other people who got downsized lying on the couch, feeling sorry for themselves <laughs> and having to turn on Oprah. But the rest of them maybe didn't turn on Oprah. So there is a big clue. Um, you have to hear something and take action. They may mm -hmm. have heard it. Maybe they took action. Maybe they didn't. But this is the crux of all of the things that you do, isn't it? Is turning an idea into action, mm -hmm. turning a feeling into action. Like how many of us, this is what I call energy leak, Sharon, that we have an energy leak that is every time you walk by the garage, you go, oh, I've got to do something about the garage. And mm -hmm. every time you have this loss of energy and yet you need someone who will come along and say, okay, let me walk through this with you, whether that's your buddy or whatever, which usually doesn't last very long, uh, but someone to come along and say, Okay, I'll get you started. But oh, what a blessing to have someone who says, I'll get you finished. And that's what I hear that you do. So I have some serious questions for you. Okay, bring it on, lady. Okay. <laughs> we have this emotional attachment to our stuff, as George Carlin called it. Um, and we, we somehow like don't want to let it go and we have different generational things you know like my parents from the um the depression era everything was so hard one if you'd spent money on it you could never let it go because you might need it again or it was still good and then we had the concept of saving things for good you know, 20 years ago when I was out on the speaking circuit helping people move their lives forward I would say 
ever have anybody say to you, have a good day? And of course, everybody put their hand up. And I said, so here's what I want you to think that means. Take everything you're saving for good and use it. Mm -hmm. And everybody would think, oh, really? You know, I can't, you know, we have a conversation about that. So I'm sure that there's a lot of things that you come across that still have price tags on that people have been saving for good. So let's talk about emotional attachment to stuff. What do you say when someone says, oh no, it's my stuff? Well, so everybody says, oh no, it's my stuff. Everybody. Um, even people that aren't savers say that. However, um, people that are savers are more attached and are less likely to let something go. And until, um, until, they, until they have something happen in their life, maybe it's a, cri a health crisis, maybe it's a financial crisis, um, maybe it's just an emotional, well, not just an emotional crisis, I mean, that's a big deal too. But, um, but until something happens, um, people aren't willing to let go of those things. And, um, and so one of the things we often say to clients is, and I'm, actually, I'm going to tell you a story. So I was in this lady's house and she was moving and I walked down in her basement and she had the sewing machine down there and it was covered in cobwebs and it had all these boxes stacked on top. And it was one of those uh, sewing machines that opens up, you know, it was inside a cabinet. Right. And I said, um, do you use that? And it was clear that she didn't use it because it was covered in cobwebs. And she said, no, but it's my mother's. I can't get rid of it. And I said, so um, your mother is not that sewing machine. Your mother is in your heart. And all of a sudden she started crying and she said, you're exactly right. That is so true. And, um, and so that's one of the things people don't think about is that they have a memory. Um, and, and just let me apologize. My printer is doing something goofy over here. And I didn't no touch worries. it. I didn't print it. I, I don't know what's going on over there, but there's a ghost in my printer. Um, so, so anyway, when people um, are really struggling to let go of things, you ha sometimes have to take a step back and say, okay, so what is it about that piece of furniture or that piece of cloth or that picture or whatever it is um, that means something to me? And it's usually because there is an emotional attachment, some kind of sentimental something. And so one of the things that we encourage people to do is write a story in a journal about the the memory and then um you're also having some technology stuff yeah. going on um so write a story in a journal and take a picture and put the picture with the story and so rather than hanging on to the piece of furniture they can have a picture of the furniture which will store flat and doesn't take up very much room and they have the story so they won't forget it so, I love that. I love that because I often say that to people too, you know. Of course, many times when I'm working with people, there are so many things that they need to examine. And one of the things is this, you know, I'm thinking of a client that I worked with by telephone actually because it was before we had video conferencing. So I was working with her long distance by telephone and I'd had two sessions with her then I said to her, I'm going to take a really big risk here, if you don't mind, and I'm going to describe you and your home. Oh, and wow. Said, okay. Now, yeah, you know, I was really going out on a limb here, but it was so clear to me intuitively what was going on. I said, you live in an apartment, I know that, and I think you have a path from your front door to your chair to your kitchen, to your bathroom, to your bedroom, but the rest is covered, the floor is covered. And I said, I have this sense that your microwave is used much more than your stove, and I would imagine that that keeps you overweight. And she went, oh, how did you know? Right? Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what was going on with her. Now, yes, it was a risk on my part because she could have said, no, I'm a marathon runner and I live in a sparse home. But from all she had told me from her emotional attachment in life, 
I recognized that she would also, of course, have an emotional attachment to things. And mm -hmm. she felt so buried by life that she would have too many things. Yeah, And so that's often something that happens, even if no one has passed, you're looking at your stuff. It's that question of what does it represent to you? You know, I wrote a little book called um, Pack Your Own Parachute. And in there, I was giving people some ideas about, you know, what you want to have that are your lifesavers, the things that, that you want to um, put in, in place in your life. And one of the things was I said, when you're going through your stuff, there's a three-part test. Is it beautiful? Is it functional? Or is it memorable? So we put things in those categories. So, you know, is this beauty that I saw before or is it beauty I see now? You know, so if I want to keep beauty around me, that makes sense. And then in the, is it functional? Well, from a feng shui point of view, they would have things that were broken or they had broken cords or they didn't have lights, which are they're going to get it fixed one day or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it's not functional. You just think it's functional. And of course, the memorable, which is what I would say, you know, think about it, take a photograph of it and then release it. So we have this emotional attachment to stuff, but it extends to feeling secure about keeping paper and keeping secure about yes, it does. <laughs> all of that. So what do you do about that part? So, um, so we have worked extensively with financial advisors and CPAs and people that are very well versed in, uh, in working with paper. And so we know what to keep and what not to keep. And that's one of the things, because people will say, our clients will say to us, hey, I need to go through my paperwork. And, and we say, no, you really don't. Um, we know what to keep. And, and if we have any questions, we're going to ask you. Uh, because that's, you know, that it, there, there are often questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this was kind of interesting. We were, we were doing a clear out um, for, a, for a lady who had passed away and her son was an attorney. And he said, my sisters, my sisters and I have gone through all the paperwork where everything's good, like the rest can be shred. And I said, well, would you mind if we just like take a quick rifle through it just to make sure? And he said, yeah, sure. That's fine. As long as it doesn't take too much time. I said, yep, okay. So within the first hour, I had found $600 in cash um, right. that, he, that they missed. Um, I also found um, some death, cer death certificates and marriage certificates, both of which are very hard to replace. And when I brought these up to him, and, um, he was just like, oh my gosh, where were they? How did we miss them? And when I explained to him where they were, he was like, oh, we didn't look there. And um, and that's part of our service is that we know that um, people put money and they put valuables in unusual spots or they lose them in unusual spots. And so, um, so that's part of the service is that we want to be able to return those valuable things back to our clients. I love that because I have that exact experience. I'm an only child, so I got to do it all. Mm. And my parents were depression era parents and they, they had me later in life. So um, what I found was that I had to go through every piece of paper because of just what you said. You know, oh, here's a stock certificate in the middle of old letters from a friend. Yep. You know, it was just like is there wasn't a shred of organization because my mother was a piler. Mm. And so then a pile would go in a box. Mm -hmm. And so nobody had ever sorted the pile. So therefore the boxes were completely unsorted. Mm. And so I understand exactly why that's so important. And then, I mean, that attorney that you were mentioning, he must have been thrilled because here he says, don't take too long thinking about how much it costs. And then you saved him $600 off the top. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, and and the time and energy to maybe have to replace oh, a marriage sure. certificate or a death certificate that, um, you know. Mm -hmm. So you said that you know what to keep. Can you give people a little idea of what they should be keeping? Yeah, so um, as, as far as taxes go, um, you really, so legally you only need to keep three years, but we 
tend to err on the side of caution and many people do and that's fine. So we err on the side of we keep six years of of taxes. If you've had a business and the business has been active, um, it, like it's not closed, uh, that's what I mean, active, mm -hmm. uh, then you might want to keep those business uh, documents for the last six years as well. Um, so personal and professional. And then things like um, any property you've purchased, uh, you'll want to keep the the deeds to those properties, um, uh, that sort of thing. Anytime you have transferred property to other people in your life or transferred money to other people in your life, you'll want to keep that kind of documentation, um, just so that when if you do pass away. Um, that whoever is sorting out your affairs at the end of all of this can go back and kind of see the paper trail of, um, oh yeah, um, this lady's son still owes her $10,000 and, and it was agreed that that would come off his inheritance. But if that, if that document hadn't been found, then, uh, then he would have been cutting into somebody else's inheritance. Right. Well, really good information for sure. I got so many questions. So I, I want to know what's a better thought. If a client has this thought or if I have this thought, um, it's still good. Why would I give it away? What's a better way to approach that? Um, so there are lots of things that are still perfectly good, but you no longer use them or you no longer find them in your words, beautiful. Um, so useful or beautiful, um, or maybe you're moving to a space where, um, you don't need that particular thing. Like a lot of our clients move into retirement communities and most retirement communities don't have full kitchens. And so they don't need their baking supplies. Um, and so still perfectly good stuff, but they're not going to use them. So that's the kind of thing with, that we would help them either sell or donate depending on the item. Yeah. So just in that regard, Sharon, I, ha I read this little article that really set me back on my heels. You know, I have three children, I've got grandchildren, I've got all of this and I've planned for my demise. So I was thinking about these things and I thought, Oh, this article really hit me between the eyes. And it said, don't think your children are going to want your stuff. The new generations don't want the stuff. And in particular, what they don't want is what they called brown furniture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm looking around and I thought, well, I don't even like the brown furniture. So why don't <laughs> I go and get... Uh, find somebody who's really in need. They have a home, but they have nothing. Mm -hmm. And I will give it to them. So what I did was I looked at my living room and I thought I had moved to a new house. It was smaller. And my living room furniture, a sofa, a loveseat, an overstuffed chair, and uh, a dining room set that had belonged to my mother, which I really didn't want. And uh, a couple of other pieces of brown furniture. And so I did this. I kept looking until I found this family who had several generations. You know, I live in Southern California, so it was a, a family. We're all living together, and they had very little. And here was my deal. Here's all the things you can have, but you have to take them all. You can't cherry pick them. And the woman said, Smart. well, I want this and I want that. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's all or nothing deal. So they came and they took everything. And, and she said, do you want something for it? I said, no, I don't. I just want you to take everything. And she did. And oh, that she was, was smart. Thrilled, right? But for me, whew, I didn't want all this anymore. So I was relieved. They got all that. There were things that they could sell. You know, I said to her, I don't care what you do with this stuff. Do whatever suits you best. But you must take it. Mm -hmm. And so they brought the wife and the and the husband and two of their children and several grandchildren and they all put it into two trucks and away it went and it was such a relief to me but reading that article you know and i look at the things that i have prized and do i still prize them no i don't even like and never did like limoges china <laughs> <laughs> but it was the thing to collect, you know? Yeah. And so I have probably eight pieces of Limoges, and it's supposed to be, like, so exciting. And it's just taking up space. So what do people do 
with things that are kind of treasures from a bygone era, what's the best thing to do? So, um, so first I want to address the, the article and then I'll answer your second question. Um, so there's, I, I wrote a whole chapter in my book about millennials and why they don't want anything. And, uh, and if you don't know who millennials are, um, they're the ones walking around texting constantly. <laughs> um, and so and their children <laughs> and yes. Um, and, and so, um, what millennials would rather have is experiences. They would rather take a trip with grandma than have grandma's China. That right. is like, that's for real. And, um, and I have had, um, I have had millennials sitting in my audience and say, yes, that's right. And, um, and so that's actually just, you know, really think of it that way. It's not about, it's not personally about the stuff. Um, and it's just a generational thing. Um, the folks who grew up, grew up um, during the depression and saved everything, rubber bands and, and pie tins and, and plastic bags, um, they value stuff. That is their, that is their currency mm -hmm. and millennials value experiences. That is their currency. So if you can think about it from that perspective, um, then it changes maybe how you're looking at the things and whether or not your children or your grandchildren are taking the stuff. Well, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I obviously have one foot in the millennial generation myself because as raising my children, I felt that way. So we would take, I, I took one of my children on vacation each year and we would have two weeks of just building memories and, and we would go and do something as a family as a Christmas gift rather than well, we got lots of stuff because my parents gave a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. but I, <laughs> you know, and I fell into that trap for a while too. And then I thought, no, this is crazy. I'd rather take that money and go and do something. So I understand that completely. But yeah. for, I really wanted for listeners who think, you know, but this is valuable and it has, it has our memories and it has, you know, longevity and its legacy and all these words that we use. And then yeah. You know, I remember my daughter sitting in my mother's house and we were sitting at the table in the dining room and my mother had those um, those shields that held the little silver spoons that you got from every place. <laughs> and every. Um, my mother said to my daughter, would you like to have those when I die? And my daughter looked up and said, you got to clean them? My mother said, of course. She said, no, I don't want them. Nope. It was the end of it, right? Yeah. And my mother was so heartbroken because that represented her trips. Everything that had high value to her was a story attached to every spoon. And she couldn't get the transition to that was her experience, not my daughter's experience. Right, right. And, and, and we see that. At, we really do see that every day. Um, and, and one of the things like... Um, so you go back to the Limoges China. Um, so a lot of China. Um, so one of the things that used to happen in marriages is that women would register for China. They still do to some degree, but not, not like it used to be. And um, and so uh, we come across homes where there's four or five sets of China because many women through time have given their set of china to their niece or their daughter or their or their granddaughter and so women are just like being bombarded with all of this old china and if it's got a gold or a silver rim of course it can't go in the dishwasher or the microwave because right. that will wear off so what do you do with this stuff and um there is a place out there called replacements.com and um and they will buy china now they buy it for pennies on the dollar um, just so you know, because they're a wholesaler and they, they, they buy it wholesale and then they sell it retail. Um, so if you are looking to complete a set of China, it's also okay. a good place to go um, if you break one of your pieces. But, um, but I love the idea of what you said earlier about keeping the good and, or using the good because that's what, that's what happens is that the good China never gets used. Right. And so... Um, what if you could use it? Um, maybe you set up a special weekly dinner. Maybe it's not your everyday, but but because the everyday stuff really does get chipped up. Um, but but if you set up a weekly dinner for your family, 
um, where it's the, it, we, we use the special china. Um, uh, and I do that just when friends come over. I put out my good china right. every time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that it gets used, so that it gets seen. Um, and I love putting it out. It makes me happy to set my table with it. And, um, and it's not for everyone. There are people that will only ever use the good china. And then there are people that like who we work with that have five sets of it. <laughs> right. You know, well, and you inherit it, you know, like I inherited my mother's supposedly good Sunday china. Mm -hmm. I think it's been out oh, maybe five times in, in the 30 years since she passed. <laughs> um, Use it I, more often. Use it. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this replacements thing, but, you know, there are all kinds of things. So I'm sure that you have good tips and people can get in touch with you at BettyBrigade.com. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon started Betty Brigade, so she's the brains behind it all. So go to BettyBrigade.com and learn more. Um, because there are questions like, what do you do with coin collections? What do you do with stamp collections? How do you, how do you manage that and how, how does that happen? But let's talk about the other side of this um, when it's it's a real problem and it's become a hoarding situation mm. I had this yep. experience I I was at church one day a new church I hadn't been to and and this person got up and said we have to move this afternoon the landlord needs the place back and and we need boxes and I had just moved and I had two thousand dollars worth or a thousand thousand dollars worth of beautiful boxes that the company had paid for because <laughs> the company moved us and I said well I'll loan you these boxes but I want them back so I loaned them to them. They were grateful. And I kept asking for them back. Oh, well, we don't have them. We can't give them to you all in all. Then imagine my surprise when one day I turned on that television show, Hoarders, and there was that couple. And all your boxes. And all my boxes. <laughs> oh, all boy. my boxes. Ooh. Right? And I mean, I already knew that they were troubled because that's my my intuition and my expertise so i already could tell they have problems but of course i'm going to jump in and solve this problem because it's so physical i have the boxes you need the boxes and then we get into all the emotional stuff of why they can't give me the boxes back and then there they are on the television so what if we have someone in our life who is so connected to their stuff Mm -hmm. that we cannot even abide going to their home. How do we encourage them to move in a better direction? Um, well, that's a challenge. And we work regularly with hoarders and compulsive shoppers. That's part of our roster of clients. And, um, and one of the things, and I don't know whether this is good or bad, but uh, we become known for working with hoarders uh, because we can work in a team and we can keep the, the progress going, whereas sometimes working one-on-one -on -one with them um, doesn't work because uh, that, that organizer loses steam. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you really kind of do need a team in there uh, when you're working with a mass quantity of stuff. But one of the things that we always require when we're working with a hoarder is that they are in therapy. Um, and that's an important piece to us because we need someone who's working on what's going on between their ears. Because um, So with hoarding, it's about the stuff and it's not about the stuff. Right? right. Oh, absolutely. So, so, um, so you've kind of got this duality going of, yeah, the stuff has filled up a hole that they continue to dump into in their, in their heart. Um, and it's not about the stuff at all. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, so having someone who is working with them, um, cause we can clear it out and we can make that house look nice and neat. However, it will all come back if they're not in therapy. And do you have a, a requirement, Sharon, that there be a point person who is not the client that, that is actually helping with this process? Because it seems to me highly unlikely that a hoarder would just call you up and say, I need help. <laughs> That is highly unlikely. You are correct. Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, a lady that we are currently working with. Um, and we've been working with her for almost a year. 
I'm not going to tell you her name because we okay. like to keep confidentiality. However, um, she has a five bedroom house that um, she is using as a storage unit. She doesn't live there. Five bedroom house. Okay. She, this is the house where her daughters grew up. And she also has three additional storage units and she has a condo where she lives. That is probably three quarters full. It's pretty full. Um, and so um, her daughters, her two daughters stopped talking to her completely. Right. That's two, not uncommon. For, for two years. And they wouldn't let her see her grandchildren um, mm -hmm. because, um, and this was, this was really interesting. Um, the hoarder, um, she, her love language was gifts and giving gifts, which totally fits with hoarding and compulsive shopping. Her daughter's love language was acts of service. And so the daughter kept trying to clear out the stuff and mom kept trying to give her daughter stuff. And so it caused a breakdown. Um, and so what was interesting is that once um, once I explained to him, them, the two of them, and I like stood, this was like on day two, um, uh, the, the daughters had stopped talking. One of the daughters who, who lived nearby said, I will come and I will meet with you, the Betty Brigade, and I'm not taking anything from my mother's house. So when I explained that her mother wanted to give her stuff as a love language, she suddenly softened and got it. And when I explained um, to the mom, the hoarder, that her daughter's acts of service of trying to clear out her house was not a sabotage, but it was that was how she showed her love. Mm -hmm. It really changed the whole dynamic between them. And I don't expect everybody to um, you know have that kind of insight. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't happen every time with me either. But um, the daughters, both daughters, are now in contact with their mom, um, and this hoarder does get to see her grandchildren. Now, is there still an active hoarding situation going on? Absolutely. And the daughters have told us that we, um, as an organization, have made further progress with her than any other group has made. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're still not done. She's still resistant. She's still trying to stop us from <laughs> letting her stuff go. Right. And, and go yeah. ahead. And that's where the therapy piece comes in. Right. And, you know, I, I'm thinking in that there's a, a piece that we haven't spoken of. And, you know, we really need to end this because we, there's so much to talk about. Oh, we need we to do it forever. again. Um, but there's a piece in that that, like, a gift, people don't understand a gift, in my opinion. A gift is, I want to give this to you. Mm -hmm. But what they understand is I want to give this to you. And forever after I can see that when I come to your house mm. <laughs> and I, I was in India and I watched this and it really impressed me. Uh, we were in line to talk to a, a guru, to a, a Swami and someone brought him a beautiful shawl and it was obviously very expensive. And so she presented it to him and he praised it. And he loved it. He showed it to everybody. And then he said, oh, you've been very cold here. You have it. Well, the woman was devastated because this was expensive. She brought it from another country, you know, but it was such a clear understanding of, <coughs> excuse me, what it means to give a gift. He was grateful. He remembered. He was thankful. He said all the appropriate things. And then he gave it away. So in this story that you're telling, you know, yeah, I think that there's a very important piece there that the daughter could receive the gifts as long as the mother is not attached to what she does with them. But that's where the psychological change has to happen, that for her to come to realize that I may want to give you this. And you may be grateful for the fact I wanted to give you something, but you may not want the something. Right. And right. You, you give without attachment. And, you know, for those people, hoarders, not hoarders, looking at your clutter, looking at whatever it is, how many gifts are you keeping because somebody gave them to you as opposed to 
being very happy that they thought of you, that they, they wanted to give you something and have gratitude for that act, but not feel like you have to keep it. Mm hmm right? A really big piece. So there's so much to talk about. So I just want to remind everybody, I'm talking to Sharon McCrill, and she created this fabulous organization called Betty Brigade. So go and look her up, bettybrigade.com. And look at her wonderful new book. It's a bestseller on Amazon. It's called Downsizing the Silver Tsunami. And you can see who to call and where does the stuff go. So uh, everybody needs this. There's no question that everybody except the minimalist next door needs, <laughs> this. <laughs> needs this. Thanks so much for being my guest, Sharon. Mm, thank you. This was super fun. And I, you know, I love talking about stuff from this perspective because it's much more high level um, and it's practical. Uh, so I love that. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll talk again. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. You can find me at forrelationshiphelp.com or on YouTube. My channel's called, surprisingly, no, For Relationship Help. And every every cool. week I do a live stream on there on Monday evenings at 6 p.m. Pacific time. You can ask me your questions in the chat. We have a great discussion. So come on over to youtube.com slash forrelationshiphelp. If you want to get a little closer information from me, join one of my optimized circles. Go to my website for relationshiphelp.com slash circles, and you can join in there on several levels so that you can get the help that you need for dealing with toxic people and relationships. So again, my guest is Sharon McCrill. You find her at bettybrigade.com. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy. Oh,